This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during January. In this episode, we'll start the year with a meteoric bang, keep tabs on four bright planets, focus on Orion the Hunter, and welcome some other bright winter stars. So grab your curiosity and come along on this month's Sky Tour. If you're catching this podcast early enough in January, you'll have a chance to make note of two celestial happenings that occur early this month. First, Earth is closest to the Sun in its orbit at about 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 4th. Now, you might think that the Sun and Earth are closest in June or July, when it's hot here in the Northern Hemisphere. But actually, it's just the opposite. We're closest to the Sun in early January and farthest away in early July. And second, 2023 opens with one of the year's best displays of shooting stars, the Quadranted Meteor Shower, peaks on the night of January 3rd with a short, sharp burst of activity. These meteors get their name from Quadrans Muralis, an obsolete constellation near the handle of the Big Dipper. They seem to radiate from that point in the sky. Under the very best conditions, in a super dark sky, you might see a quad flash into view every minute or two. But few observers ever see anything close to this many, because maximum activity lasts only a few hours, and it's easy to miss. Worse, this year the peak occurs with a waxing gibbous moon in the sky. Still, this shower tends to have a lot of bright arrivals, so it's worth taking a look. Speaking of the moon, let's quickly check its cycle of phases. The full wolf moon is on January 6th, and last quarter follows on the night of the 14th. New moon is January 21st, and watch for its lovely crescent to pop into view after sunset two or three days later. First quarter comes late in the month, on the 28th. As January opens, you can see four bright planets in the sky after sunset, but you'll have to look carefully to spot two of them. Find a spot with a clear view toward west, with no trees or other obstructions. Make note of where the sun goes down, and then look at that same area beginning about 30 minutes after sunset. You should be able to pick out Venus very low above the horizon. Look to the upper left of Venus, or to the upper left of the sunset point, by about twice the width of your clenched fist held at arm's length. As the twilight deepens, the planet Saturn will pop into view. Saturn has graced our evening sky since August, but now it's time to say goodbye. Night by night, Saturn drops deeper into the twilight, and Venus rises a little higher. In fact, on the evening of Sunday, January 22nd, These two planets will pass each other just a half degree apart. That's very close, about the apparent diameter of the moon. Venus will be much brighter than Saturn at that point. One night later, on the 23rd, a very thin crescent moon will perch to the upper left of these paired planets. By month's end, you won't find Saturn no matter how hard you try. But Venus will be just getting started on a long evening appearance that will last through late July. Two other planets are much easier to find. Let's start with Jupiter, which is high in the south or southwest, about halfway to overhead as evening twilight fades. It gradually drifts westward as the night continues and sets around 9 or 10 p.m. A pretty crescent moon will be close to Jupiter on the evening of January 25th. The other sparkler is the red planet, Mars, which starts out in the southeast at nightfall and then climbs quite high up later on. Mars doesn't set until around 3 a.m., so it'll keep you company long into the night. And on the nights of January 3rd and January 30th, Mars and the gibbous moon are quite close to one another, making a dramatic pairing high in the sky. January's night skies have plenty of other marvels to enjoy. Once it gets good and dark, swing well around to the left of where the sun set until you're facing southeast you'll have no trouble picking up the distinctive bright stars that outline the frame of Orion, the hunter, who seems to be leaping up from the eastern horizon this time of year. Mars is about three-fifths higher up than Orion. 
More on the great hunter in a moment, but for now, take a look at the celestial real estate stretching to Orion's right, toward west. Not much to see, is there? This is the realm of two large but dim constellations. The one to Orion's immediate lower right is called Eridanus, a long winding river of faint stars. Now some scholars think Eridanus represented a real river to the ancient Greeks, perhaps located somewhere in Central Europe. The other faint constellation, farther west and about halfway to Jupiter, is Cetus. In mythology, this creature was a large whale, shark, or sea monster of some sort. Okay, let's get back to Orion. Look for the distinctive vertical row of three stars that mark his belt. To the belt's left, by about the width of one fist, is the red-tinged supergiant star Betelgeuse. It marks one of the hunter's shoulders. One fist to the belt's right is icy white Rigel, marking his left foot. Follow the belt upward, about two fists higher, most of the way to Mars, and you'll encounter a reddish star called Aldebaran, and it marks the angry eye of Taurus, the bull. Mars is also tinged with red, but that's where the resemblance ends. Mars looks slightly ruddy because its surface rocks are rusty, whereas Aldebaran glows red because its surface is a searing 6,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, Aldebaran is 65 light years away, two and a half million times more distant than Mars. Aldebaran serves as the anchor for a loose V-shaped cluster of stars called the Hyades. In your early evening, the V is lying on its side, with its bottom pointing to the right and its top, the bull's horns, pointing to the left. Depending on the darkness of your sky, you might be able to pick out anywhere from just a few to as many as 20 stars in the Hyades, but this cluster actually consists of hundreds of stars. Curiously, Aldebaran isn't one of them. It's just a bright star that happens to lie between us and the cluster. In Greek mythology, the Hyades were daughters of Atlas who had a knack for causing rain. Now look higher still, about one fist to the right of Mars, until you see a fuzzy little spot that you can just cover with the tip of a finger. This is also a star cluster called the Pleiades. How many individual stars can you count in the cluster? Five or six? Seven? This grouping is very distinctive, and it's recognized by many cultures, past and present. From the Celts to the Mori to the Aztecs, everyone seems to have a story involving the Pleiades. They're even mentioned three times in the Bible. In ancient Greece, these stars were known as the Seven Sisters, all daughters of Atlas and his nymphy wife, Pleione. How the girls ended up together in the sky varies from tale to tale. In one telling, things went from bad to worse for the girls after their father was forced to carry the heavens on his shoulders. With Dad out of the way, Orion started to pursue them, and his intentions were not honorable. This chase scene went on for seven years. The girls prayed for deliverance, and Zeus transformed them into doves, then stars, to escape the lustful hunter. Another story ends more tragically. The sisters all commit suicide after learning their father's fate, after which Zeus raises them up into the sky. I like the many origins for this cluster found among Native American tribes, some of whom say the stars began as boys, or puppies, or even women who love onions more than their husbands. The Japanese know them as Subaru, meaning coming together. You think I'm kidding, right? Well, the next time you see a Subaru on the street, check out the logo. It's a stylized group of stars. Anyway, there are way more than seven stars here, roughly 1,600 altogether. Any small telescope or binoculars will show you dozens of them, and they're really quite beautiful when seen that way. Located about 450 light-years away, these stars formed together within the past hundred million years. It's the kind of stellar birthplace that astronomers think our Sun had when it formed, though all of the solar siblings have long since drifted away into anonymity. That's what will happen to the Pleiades someday as well. To the sisters' upper left, about three-fifths away, is the bright star Capella, which derives from the Latin words for little goat. Capella looks like a single bright beacon, but it's actually four stars in all, one pair much like the sun, and a second pair of cooler, redder dwarf stars, all about 42 light-years away. By about 8 p.m., Orion has risen well up in the east, and coming up beneath him are two bright stars. On the right is Sirius, 
the brightest star in the nighttime sky, and on the left is Procyon. These mark the hunter's two dogs. And finally, let's assume that you're one of those people who have to be up and out the door before sunrise. Or maybe you have a fit of insomnia and wake up extra early on the morning of Wednesday, January 18th. Either way, throw on some warm clothes and head outside for two celestial treats. First, low in the southeast, you'll find a sliver-thin crescent moon parked very close to the bright star Antares, the red-tinged heart of the constellation Scorpius. Now look about three fists to their lower left, down close to the horizon. With luck and a little patience, you'll spot the elusive planet Mercury. Actually, the odds of spotting Mercury get better toward the end of January, so if you're up early enough, see if you can find it in the rosy glow of dawn's twilight. Thanks for letting me expand your celestial horizon for another month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or a review. It'll help spread the word about Sky Tour, and I really do welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll spend some quality time with the bright stars of winter. Until then, I wish you clear skies. <laughs>